So the process of making Kamurasaki has been very drawn out and, you know, if you take a look at the time between the different videos I've posted, you can see that it's definitely been an endeavor, but we're almost done. We're going to be wrapping it up today, talking about the Higizuri kimono and the Uchikake, which is like an outer garment that goes on top. These are the gown of the kimono world. They're usually highly embellished, embroidered. The textiles that they're made of tend to be really, really nice. Um, and I don't have the money to afford elaborately embroidered textiles, uh, so you're gonna see me do some techniques in this video that are experimental, things that I tried to do, some things that I failed with, and then what I did instead to kind of make it up. If you want to know more about the basics of how I made my kimono and got all of my patterns, I recommend starting at the beginning of this series of videos rather than watching this video. Kimono are basically all constructed the exact same way with small adjustments for the length of the train, if there is one, or the size of the body. Uh, all of those measurements I have gotten from Billy Matsunaga's videos about making kimono, which I highly recommend. Again, I've been touting those the whole time. Great resource if you're trying to get into making kimono. But if you want to see more of the basic making process, go back a couple videos, watch all my baseline videos, the underlayers, and then this video is going to be more into the details, the finishing, and the specifics of how these garments come together. So thank you so much for watching. I hope you guys have enjoyed this series as it's happened. It's been a pleasure to do. This has been an incredible process for me to get to make, and uh, let's get into the video. This kimono started in the way all good kimono do, with a lot of long lines of straight sewing. The Hikizuri kimono especially requires a lot of very long lengths of fabric. This project also features a lot of a material called HTV, or heat transfer vinyl, which is a type of vinyl with an adhesive backing triggered by heat, as you might guess from the name. This is used for basically all of the applique work that I do on this kimono and my main way of doing detailing. This material can be cut out by hand, but I have a silhouette machine, so I used that to cut out basically all of my pieces, which saved me a lot of time and probably a little arthritis in the process. HTV, when done on a silhouette or a cricket or anything like that, uh, requires a process called weeding, which is where you peel off the excess material that you don't need before you apply it to the garment or other item that you are adhering to. This can be kind of a tricky process, and my machine has a tendency to every once in a while just skip little bits of the cutting even after I've swapped blades. I'm not sure what's going on there. So I keep an X-Acto knife just to catch those little bits that didn't get cut. For this design, I used a reference to, I believe it is a plum blossom that I got off of the internet, digitized that, and then printed it out. I wanted this to be a little bit fancier than just regular old HTV, which I've worked with before, so I opted to add a second layer of taffeta with a backing of what is called heat and bond, which essentially turns any fabric into a heat transfer applique. Here I use heat and bond light, but I honestly would recommend the ultra strength heat and bond if you're not going to be sewing around the edges, which I did not do for this project. I will also say these are totally doable with an iron. I've done many projects with HTV and an iron like this. However, if you're going to be doing as many appliques as I do for this project, I would honestly save yourself the trouble and get one of those heat presses they sell. You can see in this clip here that the edges did not fully set down and that is because it is really hard to get a full seal of heat all the way around the entire piece in one go. And that timing and temperature can be harder to control with an iron. I really wanted to elevate these garments, so one of the things that I did was a style of goldwork embroidery using a technique called couching. You see this used in a lot of kimono if you go searching for them online. This is something that was a very popular as a way to embellish parts of fancy kimono. 
So I decided to do a little bit of it here. I don't do this to every single flower, but I also found that generally, even in traditional kimono, it wasn't applied to all of them. This was a way to add extra special embellishments to different areas. If you're interested in learning about this technique, this is not a great tutorial. I highly recommend looking it up. This thread that I'm working with is called a Japanese thread, possibly because of its widespread use in fancy kimono, but I could be totally wrong about that. My favorite part of this process is that when you get to the end of the embroidery that you're doing, you're supposed to pull it through to the other side of the fabric, which makes a popping noise as you pull it through. Another unique aspect of this specific style of kimono is that it's actually meant to be folded back in the front. There's a few different kinds of kimono that do this, but they all feature a trailing train and this fold back, usually with some sort of special fabric on the fold back. It's kind of like a decorative facing if you're more familiar with Western terms. So for this, I used the same sort of red taffeta that I used for the applique and sewed that into the lining where I would have otherwise put that front panel piece. This is also where I cut out the rest of the lining. I did this in multiple different parts, partially because it was fun and I had extra fabric and partially because this is how traditional kimono are also tailored. Generally, you have a different fabric up at the top and then a nicer fabric at the bottom. Ironically, my fabric at the top ended up being nicer than my fabric at the bottom, but it was of a good weight and it was silky, so I knew it would lay very nicely over my other garments. So I ended up going with it anyways, and it also matched the outer kimono later. To line up these pieces, I hung everything on the dress form and matched it up that way. You'll notice there's a hangover at the edge there at the bottom that is for a later purpose. It is not accidental. And once I had everything lined up and sewn on and turned it right side out, I just sewed up the collar and it was ready for the next step. At the bottom of the hikizuri kimono, as well as basically all of the other foldback kimonos I've been talking about, there is a padded hem. I could not find a lot of details about how this padded hem was made or how it was installed or sewn, at least not in English. So I just did what I do best and what cosplayers do best and winged it. I had a lot of extra batting left over from a different project. So I ended up just rolling that up and whip stitching it down to form a roll for the pad. I took that extra hangover from earlier, folded that up and over, and then stitched it down right around the edge to form the casing for the pad. This hangover was then tucked up and inside of the lining and sewn down to hold it in place. Once that was all done, it was time to move on to the uchikake. And we need to talk about the uchikake. So for catch up for people who didn't watch the first video or might have watched it a long time ago, an uchikake is an outer garment, kind of like an overcoat that is padded and heavily decorated. On the right hand side, you can see a historical example and on the left is Kumarasaki's reference photo. If you look at Kumarasaki's uchikake, there are two distinct parts to this garment, the red upper part and then a pink part but sometimes the illustrations would have a gradient instead, and I personally really, really liked the way that those looked, so my first instinct was to try and replicate that. To do this, I looked into traditional Japanese styles of dyeing and found one called yuzen, which I hope I'm pronouncing correctly. Yuzen was a style of resist dyeing using different layers of dye to create images. Of course, I couldn't do anything that intricate on my own, but I did look up a lot of tutorials for adjacent styles of dyeing dying and tried those. So this next part of the process is me attempting to do a Yuzen style layered dyeing process. The dyes that I use for this are fiber reactive dyes because I'm using a cotton sateen. I tested a bunch of different colors from Dharma Trading Co, which if you're looking for dye materials is a great option and set out to paint all of those on. This process requires painting the dye on rather than dyeing it in a bath since it does require multiple different colors. For this, I set out a bunch of stakes in my yard and then nailed the fabric to it to 
to create a frame basically and then had all of my pattern pieces drawn onto that fabric so I could paint them. I started this at approximately 6 p.m. and it was way too late in the day for it. As you'll see, the light in these shots just gets darker and darker and darker. So the way this was supposed to work is that you paint the dye on and you make sure it stays wet, which I had planned to do by layering it between sheets of plastic, which obviously would trap in the liquid and leaving that to sit for approximately 24 hours before rinsing it. Initially, I had also planned on doing my flowers out of resist, which for those who don't know is usually made up of some waterproof material that locks the dye out of the fabric. I had done some initial tests with this and they just were not working and I was on a timeline, so I ended up cutting that and just went to go dye the fabric like this instead. Spoilers, but unfortunately this did not work. The gradient was not effective and in the end I had to just cut the whole thing and start over again with a new idea. So it was back to the drawing board. I went and picked out a new satin that I thought would work well, something for the pink and the red parts, and then I ended up just splitting my pattern between those two pieces and sewing them together to make one whole garment. You can see that diagram here of where I placed my red and my pink pieces approximately. I chose to set up the sleeves this way, that way when my arms were down, they looked like they would create more of that continuous line of fabric color. And it was time to move on to the obi. I decided to do what is called a suke obi on this, which is a two-part obi instead of just being one continual piece of fabric. I did this in part as a reference to what I believe are some of the kabuki origins of this design, as well as just being much easier for me to deal with as someone who is not a professional kimono maker or wearer. To do the check pattern that is seen on this style of obi that she wears, I originally traced out my lines in pencil and then traced over those in what is called gutta, which is a type of resist. This then gave me the ability to go in and paint my lines of orange to create the check pattern without having to worry about it getting everywhere. I did have to be careful not to accidentally dip my hand in it, but beyond that, it worked out really, really well. For this color, I actually just used a dilution of fabric paint and a little bit of dye to make the color. I do wish it had been a little bit more saturated, but in the end, I think it turned out okay anyways. And honestly, I'm really happy I did this technique. I think the gold metallic sheen of the gutta really elevates the look of this, even if it was kind of a pain to do. The obi breaks down into three essential pieces, the bow loops, the bow tails, and then the obi wraparound itself. I only did the pattern on the loops and the tails because those would be the most important visible parts. The obi is stiffened with something called an obishin, which is literally just the Japanese words for an obi stiffener, basically. I got this off of Etsy, and this is, I believe, real obishin, which was very cool to be able to work with, but it was kind of a pain to thread it through like this. Based on what I read, though, this is a traditional way that obi are made. I kind of wish I'd also doubled up the stiffener because it ended up being a little bit drapey because of the weight of the garment, but in the end, I think it was okay. I just folded the insides in on each other and did a simple slip stitch to finish it up. For the belt part itself, I inserted two pieces of twill tape on either side to form the closure and then used a red backing fabric on that to conserve a little bit of the silk taffeta that I had. The final step was to make an armature for the obi knot out of a piece of wire. I used a wire coat hanger here, which I think worked out just great. It just slides right into where the obi is tied onto the body. And with that, the garment is done.